Hey everybody, welcome to our Pastor's Bible Come Study. Uh, we are outside, as you can see, and this is our last video mm -hmm. on on making Christianity irresistible. And we thought, what way to make a grand finale, but take it outside of the church, out into the wild? Yeah, kind of like Jesus, walking outside, right. teaching, sharing. Walking and talking and sharing. So that's what we're doing. And we just want a quick review, and then we're going to get to the last view video with Pastor Andy Stanley. And uh, I think it'll be powerful. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, we've got so many good things from Jesus, who said, I'm not giving you 10 commandments or 100 commandments. He said, I'm giving you one. Yeah. He said, love one another as I have loved you. It's a new commandment. And he says to love one another. And uh, that's what we've been talking about. And we feel like and this is what our study has been, is if we would concentrate, focus on, pay attention to, experience the love of God and lead with that, boy, maybe Jesus and the church and Christianity becomes a lot more attractive. And as Andy Stanley calls it, irresistible. Yeah, and Jesus made it so simple didn't he? to make it attractive, to make it irresistible. He said, just love people. And when you think about that, that's, I love uh, Jesus, or uh, Andy Stanley a few weeks ago talked about what does love require of me? Mm. So in every situation, we talked a lot about it last week, but every situation, the great question to ask ourselves is what is love requiring of me right now with this person in this situation? That's it. And God will always have an answer for us. All right. So here, you tell us a quick second about what this next video is, but this is our last video that we're going to watch with Pastor Sammy. Bill and I will be back and uh, wrap it all up. And then we'll talk maybe about our next series that we have as well. But uh, yeah. to today's last video. Yep. S session six is called A New Approach. Uh, right. Just like Jesus gave us a new commandment, he gave us a new approach. And the, the thought is, I can say the right things. I can quote a scripture to somebody. Sure. But if my approach is not good, it could not only not help, it could actually turn people off. Yeah, be offensive. So, yeah. And repulsive instead of attractive. Exactly. Yeah. And everything Jesus did, I mean, he said, obviously, the words he spoke were great. And he came with the right approach. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that. Several other things. Uh, we can cover a few things after we're done. It's going to be good. It's going to be great. Always good. Here is Pastor Andy Stanley, How to Love Others Well. Welcome back for the grand finale of Irresistible. For those of you who've been reading along in the book, you know that I've skipped, I've skipped over quite a bit of content. And perhaps you've been able to fill in some gaps for the other folks in your group. If reading isn't your thing or you don't have time to read a whole book, but you're feeling a bit stretched by this new approach to the faith that you were raised with, I recommend that you download the audio version of Irresistible and give it a listen. Now, as we conclude our time together, there's something that I probably should have told you up front, but honestly, I just chose not to. Everything we've discussed so far, everything was designed to prepare you for this last session. I'm convinced that what follows is extraordinarily important for the church, especially as it relates to reaching the next generation and re-reaching the current one. Now, if you can't remember the last time you prayed for someone who's far from God by name, or if you can't remember the last time you invited an unchurched person to visit church with you and it hasn't bothered you until I just brought it up, you may find what follows a bit strange and perhaps even heretical. But if you're part of a faith community that cares about the rest of your community, if your heart is broken over the faithlessness of a friend, coworker, or maybe a family member, if you're concerned about the faith of the next generation, and if you are open to reevaluating the approach to faith you were raised on, what follows may feel like a breath of fresh, life-giving air. Now, in this final leg of our journey together, I lay out an approach for defending, as Peter says, the hope that is in us in a culture where the Bible says and the Scripture teaches may at best be considered statements of fact, but not an argument for or against anything. In a culture that was receptive to what the Bible had to say, those phrases had traction. But my friends, those days are long gone. This generation requires lower rungs on the ladder. Now, you should know that most people who've walked away from faith walked away for reasons that had absolutely nothing to do with Jesus. 
they walked away from a version of Christianity that could be compared to a, well, to a house of cards. And here's what I mean by that. If someone convinces them the earth wasn't created in six literal days, they may begin to wonder if there's any reason they should believe Jesus rose after three. If any part of the 66 books of the Bible is proven to be untrue, then the Bible isn't true. And if the Bible isn't true, then their version of Christianity comes tumbling down. Now, I know this to be the case because I am obsessed with deconversion stories, stories of people who've left the faith. And the reasons that people give for rejecting or leaving Christianity, well, as you would imagine, they're all over the map. But for the majority of people, it comes down to one thing, belief. They just don't believe anymore. But that raises an extraordinarily important question for us. Believe what? What did they believe that they no longer believe <laughs> that left them believing they are no longer believers? What exactly did these post-believers find impossible to keep believing? What did these deconverted folks believe was essential to believe in the first place? Now, in my conversations with deconverted people, I have never heard a deconversion story involving disbelief in something essential to following Jesus. Now, I've talked to plenty of people who found it impossible to keep believing things they were taught, things that they were taught were essential to faith, and they're often shocked and honestly, sometimes relieved when I assure them that I don't believe what they don't believe either, or that a person can actually follow Jesus without believing whatever it is they've decided they no longer believe. Now, what deconverts find impossible to believe eventually intersects with something in or something about the Bible. And when it's something in the Bible, the Old Testament is usually the culprit. And that brings us to some really good news that most Christians don't know. Christianity can stand on its own to new covenant nail-scarred, resurrection, first-century feet. The Christian faith does not need to be propped up by the Jewish scriptures. In a post-Christian context like ours, our faith actually does better without Old Covenant support. Now, this wasn't the case in the first century, and herein lies part of the confusion. Jesus' apostles, his original followers, appropriately leveraged the Old Testament to make their case to their Jewish brothers and sisters in the first century. But when preaching to Gentiles, even in the first century, they leveraged a more recent development, the resurrection. I mean, think about it. When you've watched a man crucified and you know he died and you know he was buried, and then a few days later you share a meal with that person on the beach, your faith doesn't need any ancient props. Current events will suffice. Now, unlike Peter and Paul and the rest of the guys, we have an additional advantage as well. Many, perhaps most non-Christians and post-Christians have a favorable view of Jesus. They, they certainly have a more favorable view of Jesus than they do of the Old Testament. While many modern folks may hesitate to recognize Jesus as divine, they are not in the least bit hesitant to praise him as someone whose life is worth imitating. In other words, people don't generally leave the church or the faith because of Jesus. He's not the stumbling block. We have put other things in their way, things that have made us unnecessarily resistible. In a letter to first century Christians, the apostle Peter told his readers to always be prepared with an explanation as to why they put their hope in Jesus. So here's the question. Why should we put our hope in Jesus? And what's your explanation? Well, I think on that question, we should take our cue from Jesus' original hope-filled followers. So why did Peter choose to follow Jesus after choosing to unfollow him on the night Jesus was arrested? The answer, an empty tomb and breakfast on the beach. Peter, Andrew, James, and John did not decide to follow Jesus because of something they read. They followed him because of something they saw. Now, maybe this will help. What would happen to you if you lost your birth certificate? The answer is nothing. Your birth certificate documents you. It did not create you and it doesn't sustain you. How about this? What would happen to you if you discovered an error on your birth certificate? Nothing for the same reason. How would you respond to someone who claimed you were never born because of an error on your birth certificate? How would you respond to someone who refused to believe you existed until you produced a perfect birth certificate? I know it's crazy, 
But this convoluted thinking mirrors the way most people think about our faith. Consequently, as their view of the Bible goes, so goes their faith. One more. Which came first, the resurrection of Jesus or the written accounts that document the resurrection? Well, obviously, the event, the resurrection, the documents that document the event can't pre-exist the event they document. The New Testament documents are like a birth certificate of sorts. They document the birth of the church. They document why the church was birthed. But most importantly, they document the resurrection of Jesus. When your mama's friends came to visit her after you were born, they did not ask to see your birth certificate. They asked to see you. Now, while the text included in our New Testaments play a very important role in helping us understand what it means to follow Jesus, they are not the reason we follow. In other words, we don't believe because of a book. We believe because of an event that inspired the book. To put it another way, the Bible did not create Christianity. Christianity created the Bible. The Christian faith existed for 200 plus years before there was a the Bible but it did not exist before there was a the resurrection. Now, here's something our Sunday school teachers forgot to tell us if they knew it all. When Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus showed up to take Jesus' lifeless body off the cross, there were no Christians. There were no Jesus followers. Sympathizers, for sure. But at that moment in history, nobody believed Jesus was the Son of God. Nobody. When Jesus uttered his last word and breathed his last breath, everybody who had believed stopped believing. There is no evidence that any of his former followers were planning to keep the dream alive or to somehow keep the movement moving. I mean, after all, if Jesus couldn't keep himself alive, what hope did they have of keeping his movement alive? Besides, why bother? The fact that Nick and Joe were taking a lifeless body down from a Roman cross was all the evidence anyone needed to know Jesus was not who he claimed to be. Now, here's something else they didn't tell us. Jesus' teaching was not the driving force behind Jesus' movement. Jesus was the driving force. It was his outrageous claims about himself that kept the band together and the movement moving. Case in point. After that rather disturbing and confusing message that we find in John chapter 6, we referenced this earlier where Jesus talked about people eating his body and drinking his blood, many of his followers decided to unfollow. And when he asked the 12 if they were planning to unfollow as well, Peter spoke up. But what he didn't say is as instructive as what he did say. Here, here's what he didn't say. He didn't say, Lord, to whom shall we go? Nobody teaches like you do. We have learned so much. Your content is compelling. Your, your storytelling skills are uh, without parallel. P Peter and the boys didn't choose to stay with Jesus because of what he taught. They chose to stay with Jesus in spite of what he taught. They hung around because of who he claimed to be. Here's Peter's actual response in John chapter 6. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So there it is. The reason they stuck with Jesus is because of who they believed he was, the Holy One of God. You see, keeping the Jesus movement alive was contingent upon keeping Jesus alive. So hope died when Jesus died. There were no believers after the crucifixion. Now, if you're not convinced, think about this. Everybody, as in even his most devout followers, expected Jesus to do what all dead people do. Stay dead. Nick and Joe prepared Jesus' body for burial because they expected him to stay buried. On Easter morning, no one was standing outside Jesus' tomb, counting down backwards from 10, anticipating a miracle. On the contrary, a group of women left home just before dawn to re-prepare Jesus' body for burial. Why redo it? Perhaps the women assumed the men were rushed and didn't do it right. After all, they were rushed, and after all, well, they were men. Anyway, either way, these broken-hearted women expected Jesus to remain in that tomb until his body decomposed and his bones could be collected and placed in an ossuary. The point being, 
Nobody was planning to keep the movement moving. Nobody was planning to keep that dream alive. But then again, nobody expected nobody. And even when they found nobody, nobody believed. They believed someone took the body, which would explain nobody to everybody. Anyway, remember, at this particular moment in history, there was no church. There were no Christians, just brokenhearted, disillusioned, ex-Jesus followers. That is, until a handful of those followers encountered their risen Savior and decided to re-follow. And when they did, something new was unleashed in the world, something standalone, something birthed in a nation for all nations, something forecasted, foreshadowed, foreseen, a new movement fueled by a new covenant and guided by a new governing ethic. The resurrection signaled the inauguration of the ecclesia, the assembly, the congregation of Jesus. We call it the church. This should actually this must serve as the reason we give for the hope that is in us. And here's the divine beauty of this divinely inspired sequence of events. This approach to faith in no way diminishes the importance of Scripture, just the opposite. The resurrection serves as our apologetic or our argument for the reliability of the Christian Scripture. Here's why I say that. The Christian faith began with the resurrection of Jesus. In other words, a birth, not a birth certificate. Our faith began when a handful of Jesus followers saw him alive from the dead. And just as the resurrection of Jesus served as the reason they would later give for the hope that was alive in them, so his resurrection must serve as the reason for our hope as well. To state it more directly, we don't believe because the Bible says, we believe because Jesus rose. And why do we believe that Jesus rose? Because the Bible tells us so? No. It is way better than that. We believe Jesus rose from the dead because Matthew tells us so. Mark tells us so. Luke tells us so. John tells us so. Peter tells us so. James, the brother of Jesus, believed it to be so. And last but not least, the apostle Paul came to believe it was so. Eventually, church leaders collected these individual declarations of faith, including the four accounts of Jesus' life and teaching, the Gospels, and bound them together and titled it the New Testament. But it gets better. You see, once someone accepts the historicity of the resurrection, you don't generally have to convince them to lean into what Jesus said and did. And when somebody becomes fascinated with Jesus, they usually become fascinated with the backstory as well the Jewish scriptures. The moral of this story should be quite encouraging to most of us. Your unbelieving friends don't have to accept the Old Testament as reliable or even the New Testament as inspired as a precursor to embracing Jesus as Savior. Your skeptical, unbelieving friends don't have to accept the authority of a book before accepting the historicity of the resurrection. To state it in rather indelicate terms, the resurrection is the horse. The Bible is the cart. Unfortunately, most of us grew up with that particular cart sitting in front of that particular horse. We were taught to believe that everything in the Bible was true because it was in the Bible. We inherited a text-based faith. So we grew up believing Jesus rose from the dead because, well, because the Bible says he rose from the dead. But once upon a time, our faith was event-based, perhaps just perhaps we should start showing off the baby from Nazareth instead of trying to convince everybody that his birth certificate is accurate. Now, if you're having a hard time wrapping your mind around all of this, I, I understand. Like me, you may have grown up on a Bible first, Jesus second preaching and teaching. If so, like me, you believe the Bible was true before you read it. Anything wrong with that? I, I hope not. My children believe the Bible is true before they read it. But this order of things explains why we have such a difficult time doing effective ministry outside the circle of the already indoctrinated and the already convinced. So, if the church is going to regain the first century status of irresistible, we have to change the way we talk about the Bible, and we have to shift the spotlight off the infallibility of the Bible and onto the resurrection 
of Jesus. Why? Because most educated people have an educated opinion about what the Bible is and what it isn't. They do not walk into our churches and our Bible studies with a blank slate. They walk in with full slates. Consequently, we must shift our approach. And as we've seen, there is a first century precedent for doing so. When scientific claims and archaeological discoveries threaten to undermine the credibility of the Old Testament, Christians often feel but they often feel compelled to either rise up and defend the Bible or to look the other way lest they see something that undermines their own faith. But honestly, both responses feed a false narrative regarding our faith. Our faith doesn't teeter on the brink of extinction based on the archaeology or the history of the Old Testament. Anyone who lost faith in Jesus because they lost faith in the historical and archaeological credibility of the Old Testament, well, they just lost faith unnecessarily. The faith of Jesus' earliest followers did not rest on a historically, archaeologically, or scientifically accurate book, and yours shouldn't either. When skeptics point out the violence and the supposed misogyny and the scientific and historically unverifiable claims of the Hebrew Bible, instead of trying to defend those things, we can just shrug and give them our best confused look and say, I'm not even sure why you're bringing this up. My Christian faith isn't based on any of that. And by the way, it isn't, or it shouldn't be. Peter's wasn't. Paul's wasn't. Catherine's isn't. At the time of this recording, Catherine is an above average 10th grader who recently transitioned from a small Christian school to a really large public high school in our area. I asked Catherine's mom to read and critique the manuscript for Irresistible. Catherine asked her mom what she was reading, and when she found out, she asked if she could read it as well which she did. Fast forward several months and Catherine found herself in an honors biology class where she was confronted for the first time with the theory of evolution through natural selection. Now, during her Christian school years, Catherine was taught creationism and was armed with a few basic, but honestly, rather simplistic arguments against Darwinism. Catherine's public school biology teacher knew she had transferred in from a Christian school and he assumed correctly that what he was teaching her was new for Catherine and in all likelihood probably contradicted everything she had been taught her entire life. To his credit, on two occasions, he actually asked Catherine in private how she was faring. And on both occasions, she smiled and responded, fine. Her grades were certainly fine, which may have been what piqued his curiosity. Toward the end of the semester, he asked a third time, Catherine, I know all of this is new to you. How are you handling it, you know, personally? And instead of launching into a defense of creationism or a critique of Darwinism, Catherine said, I find it all very fascinating. Besides, this doesn't have anything to do with the foundation of my faith. And she was right. Smart girl. Catherine is both exceptional and, unfortunately, she's an exception. You see, the approach to preaching, teaching, writing, and evangelism that most of us saw modeled and consequently inherited is perfectly designed for a culture that no longer exists. The Bible says does not carry the weight that it once did. But fortunately, first century church leaders showed us the way forward. They put all of their eggs in one basket, the Easter basket. They leveraged the event of the resurrection. And the time has come for us to do the same. The time has come for us to acknowledge the new normal and adjust our approach. If we genuinely care about unchurched people, if we genuinely care about post-church people, if we genuinely care about the faith of our kids and our grandkids, we will. The Apostle Paul, who was more than willing to adjust his approach, summed it up perfectly when he wrote these words. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. And I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. I love that. All possible means. So let's just do that. Let's adjust our sails. Let's shift our approach for the sake of the gospel. Your faith doesn't depend on it. My faith doesn't either. But the faith of the next generation just might. The faith of this generation just might as well. So let's make our faith irresistible again. Let's step back onto the firm foundation we discover in the early church, the foundation that birthed a version of our faith that was stronger than Roman steel and tougher 
than Roman nails, a version the ancient world found to be irresistible. Wow, how good was that? Thank you, Pastor Andy Stanley, for this whole series on making Christianity irresistible. The church needs to be irresistible. Christians, disciples of Jesus, should be so attractive. Yeah, well, I love Pastor Stanley's point about the disciples didn't read the Bible. They didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have the New Testament, right? They saw and experienced Jesus. And they saw that Jesus was irresistible. They were drawn to him. And now he said, okay, you go and do what I did. So now the New Testament church did not have the New Testament yet, right? Mm. It was being written. So same thing. They lived a life that was irresistible and people were drawn to them. And now today we do have a Bible. That's great. But still, what are people going to be drawn to? The irresistibleness yeah. of what they see and what they experience. And that's Jesus working through us. In fact, I'm so excited about this the study. I bring my book when we walk. Right? Even when we walk, we're up, talking man. about this. But uh, yeah, you know, it's God's love, and it's not just His works. You know, we've been talking about it on Sundays. Pastor Stanley keeps reiterating it. Uh, you know, doing the right thing without the right heart or the right motive behind it can end up being just a bunch of laws and rules, exhausting, frustrating. We're doing these disciplines, but it's just work and. Man, God, uh, th- then we're going to fail because our flesh is going to fail. And it's not attractive. It seems hard. It seems burdensome. It seems difficult. Right. But love never fails. Yeah. Love always wins. Love never fades or gives up. Or it's always patient and kind. And all of the things the scriptures teach, that's what love is about. And when we lead with love, when we, when we are helping others to recognize God's love through us. Romans chapter two says it's God's kindness, or let's just use God's love yeah. that will lead others to repentance. And and that's the point, everybody. And the point is not only for us to, to experience how irresistible God is, but to make, make Jesus irresistible to others. Right. And don't you think, Pastor Frank, when we're living that life that Jesus wants us to live, it to me creates excitement for us it it creates fulfillment for us we hear about pastors who burn out and believers who in jesus who just get tired and i'm like wait if we're living the life jesus wants us to live we're not going to get tired of it and i think part of that is when i'm trying to live by rules and regulations and and whatever whatever they're telling me i should you're just your own flesh you're just just working it out kind of work harder as you said yeah but if i'm living every day waking up hey what is god what is God's love going to do through me today? What, where, how can I love someone today into drawing them to Jesus? I mean, that keeps life exciting. And then I think your spouse sees all that. Your coworkers see it. Your neighbors see it. Your kids see it. Family members, yeah. friends. And they're like, yeah, I'm not interested. Just keep that at an arm's length. Can we talk about sports or politics or anything, but not religion, you yeah. know, because I'm just not attracted to it. I think yeah. what we've been talking about, Everything we've been talking about in this series uh, called Irresistible has been all about God's love, which will make it uh, Christianity attractive, yep. that people would want to. Uh, it, it, it will motivate us to do things. Don't get me wrong. You got to do something. You got to show some works. You got to do something. Love is an action. It's a verb. But just doing things without the right heart is we're going to miss it. Exactly. So yeah, let's keep it fresh. Keep it like Jesus, right? Right. Love people. So guys, we've been, uh, we've been, while we've been doing this series for a couple months and today's the last series, the last, uh, service on Sundays, we've been doing this love overcome series. So if you've missed any of our Sundays, man, go back and listen. There's been so many, what I think seven or so, uh, series. We got a couple more coming up and then Easter's next week. Uh, so we're just keeping this love going. So again, remember it's acknowledging, receiving, walking in God's love. And then it is giving God's love away, Amen. giving his Good. life away. Good. Hey, we would love to have you join us on Sundays. Make sure you're joining us every Sunday at nine or 11. Uh, and then uh, just real quickly, Next week, we won't have our Wednesday night pastor's Bible study. We're going to take the next week off. It's Easter week, Holy Week. Mm -hmm. And then right after it, starting in April, we'll start a brand new series. We'll save the surprise for later, but you don't want to miss it. Uh, In two weeks, 
uh, at 6.30. We love you guys. We bless you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful, happy Easter. Amen. Bye-bye.